All right, guys, we are back. This is another episode of MMA Past, Present, and Future, being brought to you by SureDog.com. I am your host. My name is Keith Schillen. We got a loaded lineup, as always. We got a lot to talk about, so I'm going to get right to our first guest that you already see on screen. He's a former UFC middleweight champion. He was also a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu world champion. He's an absolute legend of sport of MMA and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He is Marilo Bustamante. Marilo, how you doing, man? Hello, hello, okay. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, it's excellent to talk to you. I was one of my earliest memories of MMA. Oh, I shouldn't say one of my earliest memories. The first live UFC I ever went to was UFC 35, which is was in Mohegan Sun. You're smiling. You already know what I'm talking about. That yeah. was when you won the title, my man. So uh, out of all the memories you had in MMA, and you've had some unbelievable fights, you... You were fighting before the UFC. You were fighting in Valley Tudo. You were fighting in all these unbelievable moments. Is, is, does anything top that moment, or is there something that, that's, that you think is better than that moment? Yeah, I, I, I believe it was a, uh, one of the high moments, of course, of my career. Uh, I was uh, trying for a long time uh, have a chance to, to fight for a title, for a belt in UFC. So, and when, because I knew I deserve a shot, a title shot, you know, I was there for a long time uh, before the, all the fighters that were fighting. And I were, were testing myself. I was testing myself in many different uh, occasions, different tournaments, different fights against different fighters. So I fought, uh, you know, big guys like Tom Erickson. And I was, you know, I fought, I started fighting with, didn't have the divisions yet. And when my chance came, I was very confident and ready for the challenge, you know, and uh, I, you know, I got lucky and everything works well for me, but it then it was one of the highlights of my career, 100%. So then before that, I have the, I think I consider the, the challenge between Jiu Jitsu and Luta Livre in Brazil in 91, one of the, the highlights, of course, you know, the, 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 the high moments of my career because it was representing Jiu Jitsu against, uh, you know, uh, a luta livre, it was a big rivalry in Brazil. So I, I feel very honored to be able uh, to defend jiu-jitsu, to make part of this team, the team at the time they defend jiu-jitsu. And then later I fought their martial arts reality super fighting that there was an eight man three fights of the night, in the third fight with 40 minutes against Tom Erickson. So it was a war. This fight prepared myself for anything that could happen. You know, yeah. fight Tom Erickson for 40 minutes. I was the best wrestler at the time. Uh, and it was, you know, make, of course, this fight made me much stronger mentally and, and, and physically to, to handle any, any kind of challenge that could happen. So it made me confident, Sure. you know. So then that's the why I'm saying that when the title match, the middleweight, and when I fought before that Chuck Liddell, I was very confident. Anyone that, you know, step to fight, I go forward. To, I would push the fight. I, I kind of, I never step on the ring kind of, looking for a chance like uh you know for something uh or, or i mean for a lucky punch i was always after my my opponents pushing the fight we never know what's gonna happen during inside the ring you know so it can be beaten you can you know can lose but anyway i step in the ring i was fighting to win to beat my opponent the, the yeah. best i could you know so this kind of mentality that i brought from my team from my older coach, Master Carson, that always pushes to the top. And that's how I fought Tom Erickson. It was a hard fight, you know, and how I 
fought before UFC, all my opponents. And when I arrived in UFC, I, I, I was ready. You know, I, I felt myself completely ready to fight anyone. And then I got a, finally I got a chance to, to fight for a belt. And, and thanks God, everything works well, you know. So. Yeah. Yeah, so let's. So I'm going to give some context for a second because there's, there's a lot of things that you said that a lot of people might not understand, um, being if they're a, a newer listener. Now, you mentioned first. You mentioned Tom Erickson, uh, the big cat, is as they call them. Yeah. If, if people don't know who you're talking about, this is a guy that he was a heavyweight. You were basically a middleweight. You know, when you actually you know got down to a weight class, you were a middleweight. Tom Erickson was not only a heavyweight, but he was a massive heavyweight. He's one of these guys weighing in. At, at 270, 280. I mean, at one point, I think he fought in some the super heavyweight fights. So there was a, a, a big, big size difference between you. Also, you mentioned the Valley, Valley Tudo back in 1991. And, and you're going to have to help me out with this because I'm going to try to give context, but you, obviously you got to give me a little bit more. The rivalry between Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Lucha Livre is something that in America we really can't understand. Because it was not just the styles, but it was a whole cultural thing. You 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 supported one. We we don't think about it in America like wrestling versus jujitsu versus boxing. Like it, you don't represent a whole like community. You were representing a community when Brazilian jiu-jitsu went against Lucha Libre. Am I correct? Yes, yes. Uh, I we can divide the the the, the in a, in a, the time before the MMA. The Vale Tudo, uh, you know, it was uh, a challenge among disciplines, you know. So Jiu Jitsu used to fight boxing guys and judo guys and uh, the old masters like Elio and Carlos Gracie and Carson Gracie. So then it finished for a while. And then I believe the last big challenge that we had in Brazil was against Luta Livre, you know. So there was a karate challenge in, in 70s. Uh, I was a kid at the time, so I didn't watch it alive, but I, I watched the, the, the videos. And the Luta Livre, against Luta Livre was the last one that I think it happened against the discipline, between, you know, two disciplines. Yeah, then yeah. later it changed and then became, a, you know, uh, I became a mix of martial arts, everybody trained everything. Everything, yeah. yeah. Jiu-Jitsu used to win, you know, 99% of the challenges. And Luta Livre against Jiu-Jitsu started uh, on the street. It yeah. was, if, I, if I'm not wrong, it was a fight on the street that started the, the rivalry for something that I don't know. Uh, I just put myself in line to represent Jiu-Jitsu. I never had anything against the, 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 the professionals from Luta Libre. I was there just to represent my, my, my sport, you know. So it, there was a fight before 91. I believe it was 84, 83 or 80, 1983 or 1984, when fought Marcelo Berenke against Flavio Molina, Fernando Piduca against Marcos Ruas. Yeah. So... And then Eugenio Tadeu against Renan Pitangui, that was a black belt, a surfer, world uh, known. Uh, you had, you had Hickson? You had Hickson versus... No, Hickson didn't fight. Hickson but he fought Duarte, did. didn't he? Huh? Uh, he, uh, Duarte? Didn't he fight Duarte? No, 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 no. He fought Hugo Duarte uh, before, after that, before my fight. Before your fight, okay. Sorry. Before my fight, uh, he was about to leave into to US, yeah. to, to move to US. And before that, uh, Hickson tried to fight them, but they, 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 the only one that accepted at the time, I believe, was Hugo, Hugo Duarte. And they fought twice, I think, one on the beach and one inside yeah, the yeah. academy. That's the and, famous beach one, the famous beach yes, video. Yeah. Yes. And that's where it really boiled over, right? Yes. And then... Uh, Hoyler fought Eugenio Tadeu on the Kinside Academy as well. And, and then later, the, the, the rivalry, you know, Hickson moved to the U.S. and the, the rivalry keep going, keep, you know, existing in Brazil. And then it happened again in 91. And I, I kind of, you know, felt the obligation because I was a, a, a black belt competing and having good results. I was the at the time, the most experienced black belt at Carson's team. 
and I, I, I felt the obligation to be there to represent Jiu Jitsu, and I did. So yeah. I never, I never planned to be a professional fighter. <laughs> no, it just happened. You got thrown into it. Yeah, accident. So now, when there were stories, there's some incredible stories about whole teams showing up at other people's gyms with knives and it, it, it got beyond just one-on-one -on -one fighting it was started to be turning into teams and and some serious scary stuff were you ever around any of those moments that we hear about where you know uh holes gracie and the whole team sh shows up to the mo to, to the uh lucha livre or vice versa or the stories where lucha livre shows up and in helio gracie's there and he's got to come were you ever around any of those no, no, I wasn't. So I, I wasn't. I, I heard about the stories, you know, but uh, I, I, I was, I was younger. I believe I was young when Hollis went to the academy. I was kind of teenager. So teenager, I, yeah. Yeah. So did, I was really young. When you were gonna step in in '91, did you know about these stories? Like, and did you have fear that something might happen that night? I knew the stories, but no, no, you know, I was prepared. I kind of, I was already, when I, in 91, I was already 20, almost 25 years old. And, you know, I have been competing tough opponents in jiu-jitsu tournaments my, my whole life. So I was a competitor. I, I didn't have experience in Vale Tudo because I never fought before 91, but I kind of uh, trust myself very much. Uh, I was a tough, a very tough, you know, kid, young kid, young guy. And I test myself in jiu-jitsu tournaments and I was training super hard, you know. Carson was coaching very well. Carson was the best coach in MMA jiu-jitsu and he was coaching the team every day. So he passed a lot of confidence for us. We yeah. were completely ready. Yeah, I was more talking about like when you hear the stories about you know the, the the battle in Henzo Gracie where the ball broke out and supposedly there was gunshots and all kinds of stuff. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I fought this day. This day in question, I supposed to fight the fight before, the fight after. I supposed to be the main event. Uh, the promoter asked me to be the main event, and I guess one of the fighters are gonna choose the fighter. And then I, I looking for somebody. Uh, famous in UFC and then he, he kind of contact, uh, I don't know, they call some fighters and the only one that I accept was Jerry Bolanda, that was a super tough fight, fighter. And, but I took a little bit longer to uh, respond, to answer his, his, uh, his invitation, okay? And then in the meantime, he signed up Hanzo against Eugenio Tadeo. And then my fight became the co-main event. And the, and I, in the end, I was a lucky because if my fight was the main event, my fight I wouldn't fight at the night. No, no, no. Because it was a big fight inside the, the arena, and he wouldn't have any fight after Renzo and Eugenio Tadeu. So I got lucky in the end. I fought before Renzo. I fought Jerry Bolander. It was a super tough fight. Uh, Jerry was an amazing fighter, you know, very tough guy, and it, he was uh, already known in UFC as a middleweight. Yeah, champion, I think so. In '97, he was uh, he won good fighters there, and I think he got a a middleweight tournament. He won a middleweight tournament there before that. I don't know. Well, anyway, he was known in UFC. It was good for me because people, uh, you know, start to know my name better, a little bit better. Sure, yeah, by beating so, him. Yeah. yeah. Now, you weren't involved in any of that, the the rivalry, the thing that happened after the Henzo, right, where the two sides were fighting with each You weren't involved in that, right? Uh, you mean the fight on the, on the day? Yeah, the fight. Like, you know what I'm talking about? The fight, the brawl that broke out with all the people involved. Like, you weren't in that, right? I was there, but I didn't fight. No, you didn't I, fight. I yeah, was, yeah, yeah. I'm no. a professional fighter. <laughs> I was just step off the, 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 the octagon after my fight. So it doesn't make sense to fight for, for nothing, you know? It's, yeah. It's, uh, so I didn't fight. Yeah. The uh, one thing you mentioned, you said that everybody started cross-training 
doing everything nowadays. When you first came in the UFC, you were very well rounded. You weren't just jiu jitsu. I mean, you were did boxing. Uh, I know you had some judo background. All this. When you were coming up during those Valley Tudos days, did you did you envision that was the way it was going to be? That it was going to be cross training, and that's why you kind of was ahead of the curve. Yes, the fact is that uh, I prepare myself, and my coach helped me to prepare myself very well. So, and then I like I, I started doing boxing as a as a you know uh, for fun. I'm, I was 18 years old, but I wasn't good at the time. I really started training boxing like hard sparring for the 91 tournaments, the yeah. 91 challenge, and then I really started to fight boxing, sparring, and training hard boxing. And then uh, when I arrived at UFC, in UFC, I, you know, uh, in US, I, I fought before that in 2000, I fought in Japan. But I got lucky in 2000, 2001, I think so, that uh, Jerry Goller, that was my, 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 my wrestling coach, he moved to to Brazil, and then I started training wrestling with him. You know, so I had a, I, I was a judo black belt, a jiu-jitsu black belt, so I was able to take people down. You know, like I did with uh, you know different uh, opponents I fought before that, but training wrestling uh, with a good coach give me more experience in takedowns, I, more information. So and, and, and the fact that I liked, you know, before that I didn't like wrestling. I thought the wrestling was a kind of, uh, you know, oh the guy just uses strength. It's not fun to train at all. And then I start training with Daryl, and then I start to like it. Like you know, it yeah. I, I learned the techniques, so I trained wrestling for eight years with under Daryl Bowler. He's an amazing coach, and I, you know, I could when I fought guys like high level wrestlers, I could take them down, you know. So, and then I, I, I think I, I, I could prove to myself that I could fight anyone in his, his own speciality. Yeah. So I fought, I fought Chuck Liddell, the best striker of my time, you know, standing. Yeah, yeah. And it was super hard to take him down, and I had to, to fight standing, and I did well. And it was, actually, it was the, the, the first uh, time that I need to fight standing with the striker sure so i did the first test i had so then it gave me a lot of confidence because i didn't know how good i was i i, I knew i i used boxing you know and, and, and my skills to take people down and then it gave me a lot of confidence when i fought guys after that you know you could just stand like with them the, i compared it like the tom erickson fight when after tom erickson you know nothing yeah. could be worse yeah, yeah. And then yeah. I fought Chuck Liddell. Okay, for the best striker of my time. Okay, I did well. So Nobody's going to be better. Nobody's going to be a better striker. And, yeah, and then you know I yeah, fought yeah. Matt Lynn and I took him down. So and then I, I I proved to myself that I could fight anyone in his own style. That yeah, was yeah. good, gave me a lot of confidence. You know, so it yeah. was, it's it was it was important. But actually, it was you know, uh, I trained martial arts. The most I could because I love it, you know. Of course, my my I came from jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu is kind of my religion. I believe jiu-jitsu uh, above any other martial arts. Yeah. So, but it's uh, important, you know, the most you can. So I open my mind to learn, you know, mm -hmm. because mixed martial arts in Valley is not only jiu-jitsu. It's not a jiu-jitsu tournament. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you you you, you must. Know how to apply your skills. Everything. In the best way in the, in the in the real situation inside the cage. Yeah. You know. So and then because I came from the background with the, under Carson Gracie that was the best man at his time and in Valley to the time you know it was a very solid game, and then he sh showed me the, the reaction you know, and I kind of follow this direction my whole life, and it works for me, you know? Yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I, I try to learn the most I could. Yeah, let me ask you this about Carlson. So you you trained under Carlson. He's, as you mentioned, absolute legend, carried the banner for the Gracie family for, uh, for a really, really long time. 
The you broke off with him when you started Brazilian Top Team. Did did you guys? And I know you've said it on the record you kind of had a falling out with him. Did you ever make up with him before he passed? No, actually, uh, it's a. <laughs> I didn't broke up with him. He okay. broke up with me. Oh, he. You know, he, he he made his you know a big mistake. Fall on, kind of uh, listening people that was around him, that telling him that he will be. Uh, People that you know, they, they, they kind of get inside his head that people are gonna leave his team. I would never leave his team, never ever. And after he put me out, I returned many times, ask him to you know reconsider reconsider his decision. And I stopped to ask him that when he something or sometime he didn't shake my hand. And then I stopped looking after him. And just, but even that, even that, I was hoping that was just uh, misunderstood from his part. But I, I really kind of give up completely when he offered to train Tito Ortiz and Chuck Liddell against, against me. you. And then there, this time, it was completely, for me, it was the, the finish of the relationship. Yeah. You know, for me, there was the kind of rock over the relationship for many years. Yeah. Before that, I, I would accept, you know, he said a lot of bad things about me and my, 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 my training partners. And, you know, but even that, there was a way to, to solve. Yeah. But after he, he asked, you know, he kind of looking for Chuck to train them. Yeah, yeah. I guess I kind of, I give up. I, I, That's for me. And, yeah. And, then, you know, we never... Uh, we never talk anymore. We never speak anymore after yeah. that. That's, that's For me, it was a very tough situation because uh, Carson was kind of uh, uh, somebody that uh, guided me for so long. I arrived in this academy. I was 10 years old. Stayed there for 25 years. I was look up, look up him. You know, I would have never leave him for any reason. I was. You know, the, 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 the most experienced fighter at the time, I was coaching the best fighters. I was coaching, you know, guys like Carlos Barreto. Uh, first fight of Zamaris Perry, I was the one that coached him. Yeah. You know, many of the, 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 the gener generation, you know, younger than mine. So, and I was always loyal to him. So yeah. It was, it was, you know, it was very hard. I woke up, I, I dreamed with Castle many times, you know, it was very tough uh, time for me. Yeah, you know? I can only imagine. I, yeah, it wasn't my, my choice. I did my best I look after and when I received the, for example, he was kind of followed the, 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 the mind of people that was around him. And he made a contract. It was, you know, the problem was a contract that what did he wanted that people sign it, and I, and I, and I, nobody signed the contract because this contract was saying only the obligations of the fighters and not his obligation as a coach. The only obligation that he had is let the fighters fighting in his academy, you know, and it was the middle of the discussion and show up the fight in 2000 UFC Japan. Yeah. And I, looking for him, said, hey, Carson. I went to his academy and said, hey, man, if they call me to fight UFC, let's go to me, let's go with me to Japan. You know, we, will say we have the deal. I always pay you 20% of my personal problem. I'm going to pay you. And then every time, you're going to keep talking about the discussion because for in my mind, wouldn't, you know, would something will be solved some way, you know? I couldn't believe that it was finished the way it happened. And then I said, no, no, I won't go if you want to sign the contract. I said, man, I won't sign this contract. If you want to make a, a fair contract, let's go to attorney and they're going to make a, a good contract for both parts. And I, we have been, you know, it was a 2000. I have been fighting for you for, you know, for many. And my first professional fight was 9-1. I yeah. had been training your, your fighters. I had been helping. I had been, 
I won't do anything different than that. But if you want to sign a contract, I'm like, going to make a fair contract. And he said, no, I won't go to Japan. I won't go to Japan. I said, okay. And then I went to Japan and I fought. And then during this time, he, he posted something internet that I was uh, out of his team. Yeah. And when I returned, I looking for him and try to, you know. Talk to him. Talk to him to, in a good way and make him, you know, considering the, the decision. And I, I keep doing this for many times. Since the situation I told you, I met him and I went to shake his hand. He didn't shake my hand. And then I kind of stopped looking for him. Yeah. You know? And then so that's, and then you created with Mario Sperry and... Yeah, and then we, 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 we you know, uh, well, finally we left. And then we found the Brazilian top team. Me and my, my, my teammates that was in the same situation. Everybody was the same situation. Yeah. Me, Mario Sperri, Ricardo de Borio, Luis Duarte, and many other fighters that came. Yeah. The, 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 let me let me name some guys, and I'm going to forget some people, and I apologize for forgetting some people, because you guys had one of the most amazing teams of all time. Uh, yes. So this, all the guys you mentioned, Ricardo Arona, uh, yeah, Ricardo Arona, Paulo uh, Filo. Uh, Paulo Filho didn't came at the time. Oh, a little he later, was right? Keep training. Yeah, actually, Paulo Filho at the time he came to training. Uh, he was hiding himself to train with me. Yeah. You know, but I I never call him to to make part of the team. He just came later. He came later. So but how Alan Alan goes? Alan goes. Uh, Ricardo Arona, Vitor before Carlos oh. Barreto, that was my student. Uh, and many other fighters. The New Guerra yeah. brothers came at one time, right? New Guerra brothers, they came. Yeah. And so th this team is is as good as the team. And then and then, besides the main place, then you started opening up places all over the world. When you yes, actually, yeah, actually we had some places. Some uh, uh, I was the one in charge of the affiliate schools, and. We had some, we started with the Boston and uh, Canada and Montreal. Montreal, Fabio Landa, he's still there coaching, coaching many good professional fighters. He coached George St. Pierre in the beginning. Till George Purple Belt, he was under Fabio Orlando. And then he fought, he, I mean, he coached a fighter, a UFC fighter, Patrick Cote. After. Patrick Cote, yeah. And then he fighting the. Jordan, Jordan, I forgot his first name. Jordan, very tough fighter. Skin Jordan? Guy. Jordan, yeah. Jordan Mean? Yeah. He's from that area. I think it might have been Jordan Mean, maybe. I don't know. Let me let me I tell you right now. Just give me a second. Anyway, <laughs> and then, you know, we start to work as a affiliating schools. Yeah. And... Uh, and you got affiliations. Doing. You got affiliations yeah, all over the Charles world. Jordan. Charles oh, Charles Jordan. Jordan. Yeah, he fights yeah, in the UFC Charles now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's a very tough fighter. Yeah, yeah he's in the UFC now. Him. Yeah, he now. just fought. He just fought a couple weeks ago. Yeah, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. So right. let me let me ask you this because is because we could go down and talk about the history of Brazilian top team forever. Really, it's 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 yeah, yeah. one thing that you guys are always linked with is Shootbox Academy. You guys had one of probably the greatest rivalry between two teams ever. Yes. Let yeah, me ask you this. True. Now, we know about the rivalry inside the cage. The, you know, Vandalay Silva versus Ricardo Arona and, and you know, the, all the matchups. Right. How about outside? Like, was it was it a true, like, were there true black, bad blood or was it just, like, competitive, you know, athletic competitive? Yeah, uh, at the beginning, it was. I never had any problem. I wasn't in Japan when it started. Maybe if I was there, I wouldn't let it go so far. You know, it was a misunderstood from the uh, guys from Shooty Boxy, and they realized that after uh, I start because uh, the Japanese people they ask that uh, the opponent of Asuero Silva, that the guy from Shooty Boxy. The Japanese organization asked us if the, the, the Japanese opponent of Asuari could go to our training. Mm -hmm. 
I said, no problem. They, they, you know, they, I wasn't there, but my, my teammates said, no problem, he can go there. And then uh, Marius Perry, uh, unnecessary, but being polite, he said that to, to Rudimar, Rudimar, that was the leader of a shoot box, the situation said, look, uh, we won't train the guy, but uh, he's going to the academy to train with us, but, you know, I have nothing against that. But unnecessary, because everybody was professional. It doesn't, you know, doesn't have any reason to give any kind of explanation the situation. Anyway, they took in the wrong way, and the next morning, Ricardo Arana was in the breakfast, and Vardelay as well. <laughs> two, two super tough guys. Yeah, and two Ricardo, of the best. Ricardo told him, good morning, and Vardelay didn't answer, and then Ricardo, I said good morning. And then they start to argue badly, you know, almost fighting, and then start from there. Yeah. It was an accident, but uh, it was a misunderstood, misunderstanding. But uh, in the end, it was good. It was good for the fans. Good for the fans, good for the show, good for the teams, because you have, you know, uh, everybody wants to see the, the teams fighting and the teams fighting each other. Yeah, yeah. So then we, we, we had uh, 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 a lot of fighters fighting in pride. Yeah. And all over. And the team, uh, in the end, it was good. As a, you know, as a rivalry, it was a good. Yeah. But I, I never had any problem outside the cage with all of them, you know, even no. I, mean, I, have, I, I always have a lot of respect for them. They, have, they respect me, you know, very, very much. So on my side, no bad blood at all. Or yeah. just uh or just a sport. It, it it seemed like the bad blood for the most part led to Vandalay and, and Ricardo Rona. Like those were the two that kinda led and then they were in the same weight class. They were both two of the best guys in the world. They would end up fighting each other twice, you know, both of them winning once. So uh yeah, that that if, if people don't know the history of between uh that time, you not only do you have two of the best teams, you got the best fighters in the world. How did you guys balance the egos in the gym? Because, as you mentioned, you're one of the leaders, but the the list of guys in your team is they're all the best guys in the world. Like, how did you guys keep it so egos would stay in check, so you guys could continue to be so successful? Yeah, it it was hard because uh, we were four leaders, and Ricardo Liboro he left early to 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 U.S. to help to found the American top team and left three leaders, me, Zé Mario Sperri, and Luis Duarte. And we were very amateur at the time, you know, as, a, as a managers of a team. And the business was just growing and we were learning with our mistakes. So we kind of uh, made a lot of mistakes but the, 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 the biggest point that uh, later we had problems with the, some fighters is that it was, it were three different minds, completely different minds. Sure. Leading at the same time. So it didn't, couldn't work. Yeah. You know, because you say A, the, 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 the other guy, the, the other leader say B. So it was the beginning of the problem was just in the beginning because two different personalities, two different minds, concepts, you know, I was, I was the one, the, you know, try to be really, uh, I concern very much about the discipline. For me, you know, the, the, the best fighter, the most famous fighter, he must be on time. Yeah. He, he doesn't have any benefits because he's a good fighter at all. It doesn't matter who he is. So I always work like that, you know. Yeah. So, but it didn't work like this because some people think different in the end. You have some, they treat different because the, the fighters were famous and, you know, and then it start to, 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 to bother the relationship between the leadership and the fires, and it was, I think, was the main, uh, the main. How can I say? 
the main thing that made the, the, the teams fall apart later, you know. So yeah. we lost some fighters because of, you know, and then I, I didn't want to work anymore with my partners because uh, we, we did a great job together. That's the truth. We, yeah, you we had a great run. Together. We built together a great team. With the, but the relationships start to get confused, you know, and a lot of arguing. And so, you know, a certain time I, I, did, I, I just wanted to follow my own path. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to my to my partners at the time, and then we we kind of broke broke up in a good way, you know. So yeah, yeah. each one follow his own way, and then we decided I, I would like to to keep the name, and we made a deal, and I keep the name, keep the team. And that's so, what you do now. Yeah, that, that's you know that's what I like. Instead, I could work with under my name, you know, Mudlo Bustamante is a very strong name in martial arts. But I'd like to create a team for my affiliates that everybody was the owner of the team, yeah. the, the owner of the of the name. Of I the mean. name, yeah, yeah. Because my name is my name. Sure, yeah. You know, I'm but, Murillo, so always going to be the team of Murillo. Brazilian yeah. top team. We have uh, almost 50 academies around the world. Yeah, so yeah. the team's part of everybody, of all yeah, affiliates. Yeah. So, you know, so it's a, it's a, I, I believe more that than work with my name. Yeah. And, and, so and I keep, what you're referring to is a lot of jujitsu academies will have uh, the name of the, the master. And then that, this would be uh, Henzo Gracie Academy, but then there's a Henzo Gracie Academy Philly, then there's a Henzo Gracie Academy in different, all around the world. You wanted to not have your name over all of it. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Nothing against people that do that, you know. Uh, that is a word. I don't know the proper word. That uh, people that, you know, the word is belong. You know, the team belong of everybody. Yeah. yeah. Part of them. My name is my name. My name is Murillo. Belong to me. The sure. top team belong to all my affiliates. To everybody. They, yeah. They work together to make the name bigger. Yeah. That's what so, I believe for a team. It's a whole team, know? yeah. Nothing whole... against that uh, Renzo that he works with his own. He's a, has an amazing, he's a sure, legend, sure, yeah. has an amazing name, Hoyce, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But I believe that, you know, I believe to create a team that belongs to all my students, all my affiliates. It's a big family. Sure. You know. Let me, let me so, ask you. And then I, and then I wanted to, to keep the name. And then when we broke up, I, I we talk and, you know, and I, and I keep it. Yeah. But in a good way, you know, I still shaking hands with Mario Sperri and uh, Luis Roberto and, you know, everybody. But we worked together for a long time. But that's it. I, I think it will create a, a, a very, you know, a very good thing in our lives. We, we, we accomplish a lot together. Sure. Absolutely. Let me ask you this. What is your relationship like with the UFC now? Because you were the champion at one point and you you never lost the belt you you gave it up to go to pride like, what is your relationship now with them i have no relationship is it is it a i mean do you say that just because you know you're retired or is it is it a bad relationship no i have no relationship yeah no, no not because i retired i i i i, I, I I, re I retire as a fighter i retire as a coach i'm not coaching professional fighters no i know anymore. i know yeah you know but uh, I felt that uh, UFC kind of, uh, uh, after I left, they keep a little bit, uh, how can I explain? They got a, it's not affected, but uh, they, they felt, you know, that uh, the situation, the, uh, how can I say the right word? They got hurt. They got hurt, yeah. Yeah, they got hurt, you know. But it wasn't my mistake. It was a kind of a business mistake for, you know, because I tried to renew my contract before my fight. Yeah. Now, did before you... My, I knew it was the last fight, and I, I got a problem with my, my, my hand. I couldn't train proper. I was very insecure for the fight, my last fight. And I asked my manager to renew my contract, but they didn't want it. So, and then later, we, we, we didn't... And this is the uh, Linland, Linland fight, right? Linland fight, yes, yeah, Linland fight. They didn't want to renew your contract because they thought he was going to win. Yeah, 
they, they thought he's gonna win. <laughs> and you, he, I believe I, I, that's my thought. I, I think he, they thought he's gonna beat me. Yeah, and you, you beat know. him twice. <laughs> yeah, I beat him twice. <laughs> uh, so. You left the UC. Was it strictly? Just, it was strictly just a money deal, right? Like you just left because private was getting yeah, no money. Yeah, the, the, the truth is that, uh, from my side, my history, my story is that uh, uh, they made an offer. It was a good offer, but I knew that my father was making a lot of money in Japan. Yeah, yeah. More than myself, and I and and I had a, the right to looking for around before I accept. I had a you know a time that I could looking around the market. And then I look around and I didn't get any deal in, in, in Pride or anything better, any, any, any offer. I don't know why. Maybe they Pride respect UFC because I was a damn good fighter at the time. So you were a champion. Fight. The Japanese would like to have me, but they didn't offer anything. So probably they respect UFC. And then I returned to sign said, okay, that's gonna sign. I'm gonna stay, no problem. And then they dropped the offer. Uh, for the same money that I received for my last fight. And then, and then I got, you know, a little bit, uh, it bothers me. Yeah, because, you got hurt now. Yeah, I got hurt because I, 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 I made a damn good job. And I almost, I could lost the, the, the fight. I submit the guy and then after that, I could lost the fight. And then it was bothering me the situation with the referee, with the Big John. Yeah. I know Big John didn't do a mistake. It, yeah. it was a mistake. It was yeah. his biggest mistake in life. He was the best. I believe he was the best in Octagon. Unfortunately, his mistake was with myself. <laughs> let me let me stop you for a second so I can explain the background. So because some people might not know what we're talking about. But, so okay. you fought Matt Linlin. You got him in a submission. He did a he tapped real quick. You let go of the submission because you're a professional. You know he tapped. Big John didn't see that he's tapped. Matt Lillen argued that he didn't tap. They restarted the fight, and then you submitted him again in the same fight. So that's just the background of what you're talking about. I, I want to make sure the listeners know exactly what we're talking about. Um, so you leave. You're fighting, you fight in Pride for a really long time. Uh, you fight the who's who's. You fight Dan Henderson. You fight Rampage. You fight, you fight everybody. UFC buys Pride, but you don't come over with them. Is do you think that's because of you leaving, or why, like why didn't you come? You know, when when UFC bought Pride and and some fighters came over, some fighters didn't. Like why didn't you come back to the UFC? Mm, I don't know. That I will ask them. <laughs> do you think it was? They didn't because, offer. I mean, they do you didn't think offer it, me anything. They didn't offer you yeah. anything. No, they didn't offer me anything. Just make a cor uh, correction, a small correction, uh, when it was saying about the Metalino fight. Yeah. I didn't release. Oh, I apologize. His arm because he tapped. I released because Big John touched my chest. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He stopped the fight. Okay, he stopped it, and then he thought he messed up. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. It's it a long time ago. I'm just, yeah. I, no, no I, problem. I, 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 I apologize. I thought for some reason I thought you let go because similar to remember. Yeah, I let go because of the referee stopped the fight. Yeah. Cause remember, because actually I didn't see that. I couldn't see his because he tapped just really smooth. Quick. Yeah, yeah. It was smooth. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but returning to the UFC, I didn't receive any offer, and at the time, and then I I, I spoke, I had a, a a deal with a manager, a different manager later, and I spoke, my manager asked him to to spoke to to Joe Silva at the time, and they made a you know an offer, didn't didn't make uh, sense. It didn't make sense at the time, and then I, you know, you went elsewhere. Then, I never, I never happened again. And then later, I spoke to Dana White. I, I met Hanzo in Canada, and Hanzo was supposed to fight Matt Hughes. Yeah, yeah. And I said, man, you have to return. I have to return. And, and I said, Hanzo, it's, it's gonna be, you know, it won't happen. No, let me spoke to the Dana. And you know, and then I'm gonna give him an idea, and then he sent a message to Dana. Hey, you have to bring back Murillo, and blah blah blah. And then I spoke to Dana, and it didn't happen. So Just you know, I said, man, it would be nice to, re to retire in the UFC, and blah blah blah. But Dana didn't Just care. Didn't doesn't. work out. Yeah. Do you? So you're not in the UFC Hall of Fame yet. I'm. 
I would assume that. And I, I don't think it's going to happen at all. You don't think because in just because you left, do you think that's why? It, it, it's going to happen. It's gonna, I mean, it's going to help them to don't don't bring me anyway. I don't know. It's it, it's hard to tell, you know. But I, I don't believe it's going to happen. That's yeah. my that's my feeling. Do, do you, you know? care about it? I will feel honored. Sure. Very honored to be in the Hall of Fame, you know. But. But there's people, that you understand this, life. there's people who, if you have a rough patch with them, you don't get it. I mean, perfect, your example, another example, uh, Jens Pulver had a little rough patch, he's not in. Frank Shamrock had a rough patch, he's not in. I mean, these, all, all three of you guys are pioneers, all three long champions, like all three of you guys need to be in, you know, over some people who are in already. Uh, let me ask you this. It, we got we got to start wrapping up. When did you know it was time to retire? Uh, I fought. I fought. Uh, I fought two thousand eight, two thousand seven to two thousand eight. Right? Yes, I fought in Japan my last time. Yeah. And then I I came from two victories. And I lost, you know, I, I, and the lucky punch, I was, you know, it's a, a judo guy, the Takimoto. Takimoto is a super tough guy in judo, but was fighting pretty well. And then I was, I finished the first round, I almost knocked him out. In the second round, I, you know, I said, man, I'm going to knock this guy out. And I went hard, super hard. And then... He, he got a counter and he knocked me down. Yeah. And then it counts and I lost the fight. Anyway. And then 2009, uh, I have some family problems. My man passed, my, my mother passed away and I was about to, you know, fix my life. And 2010, I wanted to fight again. And I had a fight in Australia against Jess Taylor. Yeah, ultimate fight. I was very well prepared. I was super prepared for this fight. You know, Jess Taylor was a young dude, super good wrestler. And I got a problem during the fight that I got a dizzy. Dizzy. Dizzy? Dizzy, dizzy. yeah, dizzy. Completely dizzy because I had a problem with my, inside my ear. Equilibrium. Your equilibrium yeah. was off. Yes, because something I got a I, I believe I got a punch on the ground. I was he was working ground and pound. I was okay, you know. But probably got a punch and I hit my head on the on the on the on the mat. But wasn't I was I was okay. When I stand up, my boxing was super sharp at the time. You know, I made a boxing uh, fight in Rio against a, a good boxer just to sharp my hands. I was very confident in my hands. Yeah. yeah. And when I step in, I got completely dizzy, you know, and I and I felt, and thanks God that uh, stop. John, Joe, Joe, Joe McCarthy was the referee, and he stopped the fight. Yeah. So, but because I was in a bad situation, yeah, I couldn't, I, you know, I, I, I would beat it then. Uh, yeah. I would be beat it badly because I was completely dizzy. Yeah. And then after the fight, I got a very uh, disappointed. And upset because I knew I could fight much better. We never know the result, you know. Sure. Jess Taylor was a super good fighter at the beginning, uh, at the time, I mean. And, but I was in shape. I could do better than I did. And I went to fight again. And I was looking for a fight in 2009, 2000, I mean 2011. I had some problems in my cervical. I, I, I scheduled a fight in, in Sweden and I couldn't fight two times. I, 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 I I have to to cancel two fights because of my 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 colon, my cervical, and later I got a hernia in Brazil. Yeah. It was 2011 as well. I was a Japanese guy, good Japanese guy. But at my last training session, I got you know my hernia and I got completely you know uh, sciatic nerves, yeah. feeling pain, and so I couldn't fight. And then finally. I got a fight. I got a fight in 2012, a show in, in Manaus, in Brazil, and they asked me who I would fight. I said, man, I would like to fight guys from my time with a good name. So 
Carlos Newton that I didn't fight, would you like to fight Sakuraba, would you like to fight, you know, maybe Dave Mene, you know, I don't know. The guys from your era. Yeah, the guys from, you know, to make a, a revival. Yeah, yeah. The guys younger than me, but uh, it, will be a, it will be a nice fight. And then they brought Dave Mene, and then we made a, a good fight. And then uh, it, it didn't supposed to be my last fight. But after that, I didn't receive any good offer that, you know, made me return. And then it was my last fight. I spoke to Japan after that, uh, but didn't, nothing happened. So and you just... it was okay. You know, it's a long career from, you know, you... every time at 45 years old, I could fight more. But, you know. You were satisfied good. at that point. Yes, yes. It was okay. A long career, you know. I had already a lot of pain on my body, my old body. <laughs> So it was cool. It was a long journey, long journey, yeah, yeah. but it was, you know, with some success and, you know, some, some winning, some, some losses, but it was a very good career. Let me ask you this before we wrap up, and I've held you way longer than I said I would, and I apologize, but uh, I, no I, I love talking about the history, and you had some really fine points. You mentioned Carlos Newton and Sakuraba and all these guys. Is there one guy, and you fought I mean, you fought everybody. You fought Chuck Liddell, Rampage, uh, Dan Henderson, Matt Lindland, like you know, Dave Manet. You be you you fought so many of the best guys. Is there one guy, whether it be Sakuraba, whether it be Hicks, it, or like is who's the one guy you said I wish I fought that guy, Tito, somebody? Yeah, Sakuraba. Sakuraba, okay. Is it because yeah, of the Brazilian I, 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 Sakuraba beef or? No, no, because Sakuraba was, uh, you know, it would be a great match. Yeah. You know, it'll be a great match. For, I get you it. You know, Japan. He was he was very well rounded. You know, good standing, good at the ground, and you know, I I, I believe we're gonna make a, a good a, a good fight for the fans. Sure. Plus, so, he, you know, you fought in Pride, and there's never been a bigger star in Pride than Sakuraba. He was he is Pride. You know, he was the guy. Yeah. That, yeah. A Japanese guy. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. And everyone loves Sakuraba. How could you not? Yeah. Uh, and let me ask you one more question before we leave. 20 years from now, when I mention Marilla Bustamante's name, what do you want people to say about you? Like, what do you want your legacy to be? I like that people say that I was a good sportsman and I never cheat. That yeah. the, only, the only things that I, that I, that I, uh, I, I like the most in my career. I'm proud of that. I never took anything. I never did anything outside the rules. You know, I never cheat. I never took steroids. I never did anything. So then I was a sportsman that fought the, 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 the toughest guys of my time just with my skinny body and my skills. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. That is Marilla Bustamante. I actually, we've gone, uh, at the time says 52 minutes. I wish I could talk to him longer. I, I love hearing about no, it. I love to get more stories about the Lucha delivery. We're going to have to do it one more time with just Marilla to get into those, get into those stories. Uh, guys, stick around. Mm -hmm. we got more. All right, guys. We're on a second segment. Before I get to my guest, I want to thank former UFC middleweight champion Marillo Bustamante. Uh, we got really long. It was so great catching up with, with a legend. Now we're going to a star today. He was supposed to return at Bellator uh, 259 on May 21st, but uh, seems like he got a little bump in the road. We're going to talk all about that. I'm talking to Georgie Corikanian. Georgie, did I say your name right? Yes, yes, that was good for me. All right, are you are you being are you being polite? Or you don't want to be like, come on, man. <laughs> no, no, I, I will let you know. All right, you some. Oh, no, you did good. All right, so let's get it. I I broke the news last night uh, while I was covering the UFC broadcast. Uh, sources told me that Adam Piccolotti, who he was supposed to face, has fallen out. What happened, man? Did, did they did the Bellator staff tell you give you any news? No, I pretty much got a text from them, and they're like, hey, uh, it's not looking good. He has uh, some certain kind of shoulder injury. And then my manager, uh, Jason House, hit me up. Uh, he's the one that's like, hey, I don't think uh, it's a go on this fight. He, he's injured. And then my, my first reaction was like, okay, who do we have next? Who do we have next? And uh, at this point, yeah, I don't think um, there's anyone. But uh, they said he will come back into fighting maybe august late august so uh i mean if there's nothing i have lined up i'm willing to get that match going 
Oh, it, hopefully it, it, up fast than the speedy recovery time. It's it's tough because I mean you're in training camp. You're you know less than a month away. It was a big matchup for the division. I mean the division is wide open, lightweight. So I mean it might have even been the number one contender matchup. Like I have no idea. It was it was definitely up there. Um, I are you do you want to stay on that card? Is that the plan? I do want to stay on that card, but uh, talking from Bellator, they're like, listen, uh, uh, pretty much we gave that spot away, the spot of you finding out a Piccolati to someone else, and they just pretty much tell me to stay ready uh, for May 7th or May 21st, and, and that's what I'm doing as a, as a fighter. I don't have uh, – this is the only thing that sucks being a fighter. We don't have that much control about who we yeah. fight, when we fight. So all I control right now is just my training. So uh, I'm just trying to be ready. Uh, like you said, that uh, that top ten lightweight at Bellator is uh, pretty cracking, and uh, you know I think it would have been a great fight between me and him. He's a he's a guy that comes forward. I come forward. I think uh, we both black belts, and uh, it would have been a good matchup for the fans. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's a lot to break down on that. So we'll talk about that. When that name was originally given to you, Adam Piccolotti, when, like you were happy with that matchup? You felt like it would not only be a good stylistic matchup, but also progress your career? Is that something? Yeah, of course. You know, especially uh, now that the Bellator rankings are out, uh, <laughs> he's a ranked opponent, and I used to be ranked number 10, so not anymore. But uh, I think stylistically, it would be a great matchup. Uh, uh, I know he's trying to get closer to the belt. And, uh, you know, I have over 40 pro fights, so I'm not just doing it just to do it. I'm, I am doing it to get close to that belt. So uh, I think it, it would have been a great matchup. Now, are you oh, one of the guys that really focus on the rankings? You, could, you kind of have two types of people, types of fighters. Some that really focus on those rankings. They like having rankings, kind of know where they are, where they got to go. And the other ones are like, don't even look at it because they don't want to psych them off. Oh, I'm number 10. He's number four. I'm not supposed to win. You know, like, are you one that looks at it and likes to focus? Or are you one that you don't really care? I mean, I, I look at it. I, I look at it. I paid all those rankings, especially when they came out. I, I was pretty curious, uh, about how they do it, but I don't let it get to me too much. And then again, the, the only thing that, that it really uh, uh, sometimes upsets me is certain fighters shouldn't be there. That's about it. But uh, other than that, I know where I stand in Bellator. I know where I stand in the lightweight division. And uh, it's just it's just a matter of time I get closer to that belt. Yeah, so I'm looking at the uh, the May 21st card right now. They said, be ready. That was a card you're supposed to be on. It would make a lot of sense if something happens for you to jump on that. With knowing that, knowing that you're on the short list, they know, hey, Georgie's always ready. Georgie's always been ready for Bellator. I mean, you've been in there for, for a long time. I'm looking at four lightweights. That you know, There's two matchups. Uh, Avi Ghazali versus Sean Felton. Saeed Awad versus Nate Andrews. Are you looking at them as potential opponents and you're kind of like trying to get ahead, like trying to train a little bit, thinking about these guys, or, or what are you doing? Well, uh, side, me and Side go really way, way back. We're training partners, and he just moved to Texas. He's training with the Fortis MMA. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if if I would never face him, he's like a brother to me. We're so, like brothers. So, so he's out. I would have, yeah, but if, 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 if I would face his opponent if something happens to him or he doesn't make it, but uh, Aviv Ghazali, I, I don't think that's even a fair matchup for me because, I mean, it's a – you guys are from the media. I mean, it's easy. We go on Sherdog, we look up the fighters, each fighter fought. So if sure, you go sure. put Aviv Ghazali, <laughs> who he has fought in the last five fought, he yeah. doesn't – it's not even fair to me because, I mean, I, I'll kill the kid. Like, I, I will, I'll destroy the kid. And the only reason that makes sense for me to fight him again – is because of the rankings. They they put yeah. the ranking, and I feel like it kind of screw over some of these up and coming fighters that they're trying to build. And someone like me, I could be like, yeah, I mean, I'm not ranked, but there's a kid that's ranked. His name is Aviv Ghazali. He's a yeah. 55. So, so I mean, for sure, I, I would like to fight him. No problem. It will be easy money for me. But uh, like anyone, and of course not facing Said, but if Said's opponent willing to fight me, if something happens to Said, of course, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So yeah, that's talking about Nate Andrews. He's actually a local guy from where I'm from. 
Actually, Holy you said you've known Syed. I've actually known Nate all the way since elementary school, before either one of us was in the oh, MMA oh. scene. Uh, Man, but you got to bet on this fight. And here's the funny thing: is here's the funny thing is you're from Riverside, California. Both of us are from Riverside, Rhode Island. So it'd be oh, the wow. there you go, Riverside versus Riverside. So so Syed versus Nate is Riverside versus Riverside, anyways. Uh, yeah. But I, I understand where you're coming with uh, Ghazali. It, you know, you have, you said, you got 40 something fights, he's got five fights. You know, you can make the argument from the ranking sense, but from the experience sense, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And then also, you're in Mohegan Sun. You say what you want about Mohegan Sun Commission. Mike Mazzulli, a lot of people like him, a lot of people hate him. He's he's tough. He will look at a guy with. He, he, I'm in a relationship with him. I keep my. <laughs> I keep my cool with it. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying I'm not. Yeah, yeah, I know. He's he's he's. Some people he's uh, not got dwell. But, but I know exactly what you mean. He could go from zero to one thousand in seconds. Well, he he has his beliefs and he sticks to them. And he might look at a hey, guy with five fights versus a guy with forty fights. But that's not happening. And then also you got you think oh, about oh, oh, I get you. I that. Get you. That's what I mean by it. Like he's fair. Like he's he's very tough, but he's consistent. That's one thing I'll say yeah. about he's consistent. But um, but the other thing about it, the stylistic matchup of versus you versus Ghazali. Ghazali is known for jiu -Jitsu. You're just a black white yourself. So, yeah, you know, yes, that would uh, take yeah. it. So that might not work out for you, but is that now you get to May 21st doesn't happen? Do you start focusing on all the way to August? I mean, are you going to be like, hey, next card up, next card up? Uh, I, I, I'll be honest with you. They, they offer me Kiefer Crosby. They're like, listen. Uh, how about you fight Kiefer Crosby from SPG? And I was like, sure, send me the contract. But May 21st, boom. They, they, I think they hit him up, and he said he needs more time, maybe June. And then there's another kid, Alfie Davis, that yeah, yeah. Uh, talks a lot of crap and this, that. They offered him to fight me, but I, I, they haven't added on that card, but he took on another guy. He took on a, a, a Russian guy named Alexander Shabilai. Okay. I don't know if they yet, but hopefully Belto doesn't get mad at me. But that's the fight they added. So, you know, the kid is talking shit to me, but they offer him to me. I mean, they offered him to fight me, but he took another fight. So, I'm I'm just trying to stay ready. Uh, uh, I also direct message Sydney Allah. I was like, hey, bro, uh, maybe you could step in in, in a respectful way. Sure. And we had a good conversation, but he has a matchup coming up in June, so. So I'm just trying to – what I'm trying to do is uh, as a fighter, all I could do is just be in a good shape, stay ready. And then when the call comes, I'm just going to step in. So yeah. I, I want to rank – you know, I want someone ranked. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand. They're in a really tough spot. And you're in a tough spot because, you know, what happens. Like as soon as I tweeted out that your fight was canceled or I should say Pukilati was out, then all of a sudden you got people, oh, I'll take that fight and it's uh, unranked. Oh, I no, no, but it's unranked guy with a three and seven record in in uh, Iowa and stuff. Like, why would you? Why would you take that fight? It makes no sense to you. You get it's all risk, no reward. You know, and then why would yeah. Bellator waste their time? It, it's just a tough position because you got to find something that makes sense. You got to find guys who's willing to take a fight on what four weeks notice. You know, whatever or how many weeks away it is. Yeah. It's just a tough situation. I want to talk about your last fight, Bryce Logan. He's a tough. Uh, t t you know, tough guy, good guy in the in the division. Uh, you won a back and forth fight. Well, how would you grade? I mean, you got the win. How would you grade your performance? I would say it was like not my best performance, but uh, like you said, uh, Bryce is tough veteran, not a veteran, but good up, like good. Yeah. Uh, lightweight champion, right? Uh, he he's good at everywhere. You could tell, and uh, I had to. I guess at that night I had to dig deep and find his weakness. So at at that at that night I'm not saying he's weak at wrestling, but I felt like I could out wrestle him. So I was just like, you know what, I'm gonna take him there and just uh, I'll wrestle him and win the points. And especially with the with the judge and Mohegan Sun, oh my God, it's I I don't know. I talked to Bellator. I haven't said it after the fight. Like there needs to be something done because there is a lot of uh, split decisions there. Which tells me that as a judge, you're not knowledgeable, and then they, they, they shouldn't be split decisions. But uh, you know, it's a, uh, and I and I picked most of the judges' brain on how to fight and what to do. So uh, 
it seems like over there they like the wrestling they like ending on top position stuff like that so mm-hmm. but that's where i went with that fight but again uh but you gotta you gotta like that based and i didn't even interrupt you but you gotta like that though based on your background that's something that is one of your tools is your ground game so i mean Mo, he yeah, just, yeah. you know what i mean like you gotta like that yeah yeah i mean it goes to my favorite but uh I feel like I've been in Bellator for so long. I know what they're looking for. They're looking for knockouts, exciting finishes, especially Scott Coker. He likes exciting fights. And uh, I just need to put those fights in there, you know. I mean, I'm happy I got the win, but uh, kind of not happy with my performance. But I just, you know, just next fight, I got to show up and do better. Yeah, that must be a really tough balancing because obviously the brass at Bellator want excitement. Fans want excitement, you know. But then on the same side, you got to win. It's, I mean, it's, it's, your livelihood matters on winning and losing. So if the judges want more wrestling, having more grappling, it, I, I definitely understand where you're coming from. It's a, it's a tough balance. And then you talked about split decisions. Right before that, you lost a split decision to Miles Jury. That I, I didn't mean to bring up a bad topic, but a lot of people believe you won that fight. Like, how, how do you feel about yeah. that going forward? I, I, I feel like I won that fight, but uh, again, I mean, like, me going back to that fight, it's just like I'm going worse, but like you said, not just the fans, but uh, I had Scott Coker talk to me. I had Richard talk to me, and they both saw it the same way, like how everyone saw it. And uh, and again, I mean, uh, I, I, I want to get that rematch with Miles, but he's finding somebody else. But, uh, you know, uh, I, I had a little cut from his headbutt, but, I, I mean, there's no way he won that fight split decision. And he knows this too, and... Uh, he was he was limping pretty bad in a, in a hospital, so uh, hopefully we could run it back. But I know he's just he's not gonna do it. He's a little pussy. Yeah. Now that was a move to lightweight. I know you think I spent three fights in a row moving lightweight. I know you've bounced around a little bit between lightweight and and uh, featherweight. Would you say the move to f- lightweight does that have more to do with you know being more hydrated, feeling better, or is it more because in a sense the division's wide open? I mean, the Pipple's the champion, but he's already talked about relinquishing the belt. And then there isn't a guy that's really way out in front of the pack. Yeah, do you look at it more like that? It's a great question. It's a great question. I mean, I, I moved to lightweight. I, I wanted to move there because the last four years I was not. I mean, it was it was it was sad. Like handful of blueberries, handful of spinach, cutting away. Yeah, yeah. It was it was horrible. It was it, even the next day. I would talk to certain featherweights like Henry Corrales, like Emmanuel Sanchez. I would tell them, hey, how much do you weigh the day of the fight? They would be way bigger than me. I, I would not be able to recover. But uh, And then also going back to the division, like you said, division is wide open. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, to me, the biggest threat in the division, I know Pitbull is the champion and all the respect to him, was Michael Chandler. That, that's, how, that's how I would look up. Like when I, I was like, okay, I'm going to make the – Move to 55. Who do I watch out for? And in my head, it was Michael Chandler and Goichi. And then, you know, this last fight, Goichi versus Dan Moret. I don't think Goichi looked that good. No. That's why I thought the fight between me and Adam Piccolotti would just shoot us up closer to that belt. But again, it's just Patricky's fighting, Peter Quilly. Yep. Those both are perfect matchup for me. And... Even though Pitbull is the double champ, I feel like there's a little holdup in 155. Sure. And uh, right, it's wide open. So we could, I'm pretty sure by end of this year, there's going to be a new champ. Yeah, and, and he said that if his brother earns the title shot, he's not going to fight his brother. He will relinquish the title, which, I mean, I, we all understand that. Of course, you don't want to fight your brother. So that, you know, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Um <laughs> About interim interim belt that he was like, oh, I want to fight interim that's right. belt interim belt. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and it, so- it sounds like that's the way belt is going to go. Um, I want to ask you. So you're familiar with the featherweight tournament? You were in it. Your opponents in the finals, AJ McKee. Uh, who do you got? Who, who's gonna, who's going to win? Oh man! Uh, I feel like if I ask a hundred people, I'm going to get fifty people saying one, fifty people saying the other. Yeah. But I, I mean, as a fighter, I cannot ignore what Pitbull has done for, for Bellator, for all the fights he's been winning, 
and uh, the way he finished Chandler. And then again, you can't count out AJ. AJ is on that 15 fight point. He's a 15 and all, right? Yeah. 15 and all, something like that. Something like that, yeah. You know, yeah, he finished me in eight seconds. So, <laughs> so we, we can't forget about him. He's really dangerous. So, uh, uh, it's going to be exciting fight at 145. Definitely, it's going to be exciting fight. Who I think it's going to win, honestly, I'm as experience wise, I'm going towards if he goes a little bit longer than first round, I'm leaning towards Patricio. But if AJ gets it down, he will get it down in the first round. Yeah, and I just looked up his actually his record is actually 17 and 0, which is absolutely incredible. 17. Yeah. So, um, that last fight, Aldwell put him, yeah, guillotine him with that little guillotine, yeah, like like a neck crank stuff. So yeah, that was a good fight. So what? You're picking, you know, you kind of broke it down who who you think will win. I think that's a, a fair assessment. But do you, you know, you fought AJ in the tournament. Do you kind of root for him a little bit? Because, you know, then you say, well, I lost the guy who won it. Or do you just not, not uh, really care? I lost to Pitbull, too. <laughs> yeah, but that, but that was, a, but in a fair enough, that was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I feel like, honestly, like, I look at the AJ fight as a loss, but I also look at it, it was too quick. I didn't get to open up. I just mm-hmm. got caught. And, uh, yeah, my, my, I just want to see a good fight. I want to, like, I, I was expecting to see good, good fight with Pitbull and Sanchez, but he freaking ended it so fast. Yeah. Oops. Hey. hey yeah, Do you, you see it? Yeah, we're good. We lost you for, like, one zilla second. We're good. Okay, good. But yeah, so I'm just thinking uh, past the first round, definitely Pitbull. But uh, if it happens, it'll happen first round, and uh, good luck to both of them, man. Yeah, you seem like you're more interested. Like you're gonna sit back on the couch and watch it as a fan, not not as a competitor. Yeah, yeah, I just want to watch it as a fan, see a good, good fight. Oh man. Yeah, um, I think I. Yeah, you lost it for a second. We we lose your video, but I can still hear you. So I mean, it happens. Um, let me ask you this. You've had highs and lows. That's what happens in MMA. Like, I think about your Bubba Jenkins fight. Like, that was such a fun fight. Yeah, him slamming you, you rolling through, catching the guillotine. Like, it was, you know, you've had some amazing moments, but you also had some, you know, not good performances. I mean, you know that. You're honest. What do you have to do to consistently win? Because, you know, you got to go on a winning streak to get, get to the title shot, and that's what you want at this point in your career. Like, what would you say, I have to fix this? What is it? Uh, what I fix? So, I, like, I keep telling myself, I've like kind of whispered to myself, I'm like, hey, this next five years, even six, seven years, I'm trying to pass you over medal. So I'm, I'm like, you know, this next seven, seven, eight years, let's do everything smart. Uh, so I was big time into cannabis, so I stopped that. Like, I mean, there's zero touching it, so I'm just trying to be sharp. Uh, I changed a lot of things, man. I've been. Uh, I've been really hooked into this carnivore diet. I've been eating only meat for the past seven months, so that's another another thing I see difference. And and like I said, I am willing to stay in shape throughout the year because I feel like me as a fighter, I was a gatekeeper at one point for Bellator, but I, I can't be a gatekeeper, you know? Like, the, if I want to get close to that belt, it has to be exciting finishes. Yep. It has to be, uh, you know, I got to finish my opponents. I can't just go over there, like, for example, my last fight with Bryce Logan and just take it to the decision and just stuff like that. So I got to put on exciting fights and the most importantly, finish them. And I think with that finish, the title shot will be there, no problem. Yeah, I, I think you're being a little rough on yourself. I don't know if you, you really were a gatekeeper. But in fairness, the word gatekeeper, like, I don't even know what it means. Like, there's so, so many has definitions. Some people look at a gatekeeper as you beat this guy, you get into belt, or some look at it as you beat this guy, you're in a title shot. Like, I don't even know what it means, to be honest. And, I, and I've, been, I've been covering this sport for a really long time, and I, I think you're being a little tough on yourself. Uh, Georgie, I appreciate your time. Uh, I hope something comes to you soon because I know it sucks. I know it sucks not getting paid. I know it sucks to go through camp and – Trying to get your mind ready, your body ready. Uh, I hope something goes, you know, something happens. I mean, because I'd love to see you back in yeah, there. Yeah, it will. It will. <laughs> I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. The guy, you know, the one who's uh, knocking at the door usually gets it open every once in a while, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. 
Well, we were originally going to talk and have you talking about your opponent. That didn't happen, but I'm sure we'll talk soon where we do have an opponent named. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, he is Georgie Karahanian. We're going to... What, we got to stick around. We got one more interview. We have Gary Boletto who fights this Friday for CES. All right, guys, we're going to wrap this episode up with one more interview. This is a guy that I'm very familiar with because, as you can tell from my accent, I'm from Southern New England. It's not often do I get to talk to a fellow Southern New England, but not only Southern New England, this guy's from my home state of Little Rhode Island. He actually trains in the city that uh, I'm in every day. He trains in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. He is. Rhode Island royalty, Gary Boletto Jr. Gary, how you doing, my Hello. man? I'm great. I'm great. We all got the Rhode Island accents up here. Eh? <laughs> I want to know. So, so I've been doing this for a while. You've been fighting for a while. After we've talked, I mean, we've talked at shows and stuff. But, dude, how come we haven't got you on the show? Why you been ducking me? I hide. I hide in the Bat Cave. There you, you go. Here. There you go. He's got, of course, his, his nickname is Batman. You see his bat suit. Uh, he will not be wearing that bat suit. He returns to action. You return to action. CES 62 on April 30th against Delon Wilson. Yeah. It's been, it'll be three years. It's been about three years, yeah. I mean, is yeah. it, are, are you dying to get back in there? Are you feeling nervous? Like, what, I, what are you I feeling? Am. I am. I'm, I'm excited, man. You know, I, I kind of take these things, you know, as, as they come and, and, Try to live in the moment as, as best as I can, as, such as life, you know, how, how we get through life. But it felt like, uh, you know, I, I'm sure every every fighter's been feeling this lately. The chips are up against us. When are we going to get to fight again, you know? With the, I had, I've had i had a few back-to-back -back injuries, and the COVID thing happened. And, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just happy to be back. I'm looking forward to it. You know, whatever whatever the outcome, I do my best and, and, and have fun with it. Yeah, now you're you're still young. You're still you know not even in your prime years yet. So if, if, you're you're one of the guys who are lucky. Like you could take this time to develop more, show a new game. But some of the older guys, I mean, they're losing the best years of their career. Now, I know you've been asked this question. I want to ask you. Yeah, I've heard the answer, but obviously not every listener who watches the show know knows the answer. So. You're from Rhode Island. The name Gary Valletto is a very famous name in Rhode Island. Your dad was a multi-time world champion in boxing. He yeah. um, he was on the Contender show, if, if people remember yeah. that, with uh, Oscar De La Hoya. And yeah. uh, was that Sylvester Stallone and all those? Uh, Sugar Ray Leonard. Sugar yeah. Ray Leonard, yeah. Sugar Ray Leonard, yeah, yeah. yeah. Why... You know, I know you boxed early in your career, but wh why did you come to MMA? Like you have that, you have boxing in your blood. Why did you decide to go MMA instead? I'm crazy. <laughs> no, it, uh, I've actually my my dad didn't want me to really uh, be a boxer. You know, being a boxer himself and, and taking all those punches over the years, he he pushed me uh, more in, into scholastic sports, you know, like football and wrestling and, and wrestling stuck with, stuck with me for a while. And from there I got into jujitsu a little bit. And, you know, as, as the popularity of the sport grew, I, you know, I said, eh, why not? You know? and, and it's funny because, because of, you know, your background in boxing, you, you know, your father's background in boxing, you kind of got stereotyped to be a boxer, but that's not really, a, I mean, obviously you have hands, but, you're really no, I'm a bum. <laughs> yeah, like you're. I, uh, it's, yeah, it is funny, you know, going going into boxing fights. Um, I I am expected to 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 be a boxer and and uh, you know, and, and truthfully, I, I can't say I'm I'm one side or the other. I uh, I, I feel I feel pretty comfortably, you know, well rounded on one side or the other. And, you know, they're a strong striker. I might wrestle them. They're a good wrestler. I'm gonna try to box them. You know, that's 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 the nice part of that. Yeah, I remember the, one of the first times I saw you flash in a ground game. I was like, it is it's supposed to be the boxer? Like, where the hell this come from? Like, this guy's got some skills in the guy. Like, you surprised the whole press row. We're like, yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. I heard I heard that for a while for for my first five fights in a row. They're they're like, oh, since when do you know how to grapple? I don't know. Like. Four fights ago, when I showed Jack and Grapple. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, but, uh, you know I, yeah, it, uh, I, I didn't grapple. Uh, I was on and off with it since I was a kid, and, and I had uh, three years off from from a groin injury. I uh, didn't grapple for for three years. I was boxing, and and uh, I took my pro debut on on a couple weeks' notice, just on a whim. I thought I was going to do a boxing debut, and it didn't work out that way. <laughs> yeah, and, and and everything's been you know going really well. You got a great record. Um, I hate to be the one, the bearer of bad news, but the last time we actually saw you in action, you fought Jeremiah Wells, who 
you know, would go on yeah. to be the CES champion. He would go on to even bigger, better things. He's he's an absolute stud. One of the, one of the best prospects well, at, at MMA. Well, that makes me feel better. He is. No, he. I actually, I actually wrote an article a, a long time ago. Is 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 I think he was one of the best prospects in MMA that he should be signed to the big leagues. Tell me this. Yeah. Now they always say like the saying is, you know, you either win or you learn. So. It's not a bad loss. You lose to Jeremiah Wells. It's not, it's not like, oh, my God, he lost to a tomato can. You lost to a stud. Yeah. What did you yeah. learn, though? Well, you know, it's, it's not more of what I learned in the fight. It's, it's more of what I learned, you know, just, just going into a fight um, and, and, and how to handle a camp. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of mistakes were made leading into that. And, uh, you know, I, and, and I actually had an, an injury on my jaw going into it and, he caught it good. I made mistakes, and my jaw was hanging off, man. I was looking for it on the canvas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? um, but, you know, just, just you know, how to, how to treat a camp better is, is the best thing I take away from that and, and make sure I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going into it healthy, strong, you know, and uh, you know, that's all. Yeah. You know? Now, you've, you've talked about it. You dealt with a lot of injuries besides COVID on top of this. What, what exactly was it? So that that fight, um, you know, just just before I had a hairline fracture on my jaw, just before that fight, six days before it, in a training accident, and uh, it was actually uh, somebody I wasn't even wrestling with flipped over and, and landed on my my face, and I had a little fracture there, and I didn't think it was a big deal. I, I thought, uh, you know, I didn't think what would happen, you know, what would come to happen would happen, but. Um, you know, but but also I came in a little flat, and, and you know he, he he jumped up up that wall and caught it. And uh, but going forward from there, I, I had a jaw injury, and, and uh, I had to have you know it was it was clean clean broken through, cracked on the other side. I had to have that uh, you know reconstructed and, and and wired up, and that that was about three months. And then uh, I was doing a lot of sparring with uh, Cerrone, cowboy, and uh, I was I was grappling with Joe Lozon one day incidentally and uh we were just we were, we were sparring a little bit i went to to a little little rollover and uh it just his weight a little bit leaned on it cracked again Ugh. you know so it was still not healed you know it wasn't it wasn't right still so i had to have another surgery again i uh that was another three months wired shut and and i don't <laughs> i don't know how awful it sounds but being wired shut i'd rather break anything else beside my spine right yeah. I had to break anything else in my jaw, man. That, you know how hard it is to shut me up. <laughs> so, you, but, uh, so you're eating, you're, you're drinking soup, you're eating drinking like Jello. A, yeah, eating through a straw and, and not not talking. Tough to breathe sometimes and get a little stuffy. But uh, it's 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 a horrible experience for those watching who uh, who don't quite have the picture in their head. It's it's awful, you know. Imagine uh, holding your mouth shut and, and you know for for. Months at a time, it's it's, it's awful. But uh, after that, I, I we we come to find out my jaw wasn't healing right because I had some uh, some wonky wisdom teeth kind of <laughs> curled in. They uh, they called them dancing roots. They said it was one of the worst cases. This this doctor and he was a great doctor. He's seen it all. And he uh, he said this is like one of the worst cases I ever seen. It was it was really hooked in there. I had extra root and everything. So they took those out and everything uh, filled back in, and I've had a few X-rays and stuff since, and everything's looking good. And uh, I actually did a boxing fight uh, at the end of 2019, just before the the pandemic hit, and uh, you know, as, as a way to get my feet wet and, and get back uh, to, to competition. Um, I was supposed to fight last last March um, or April rather, and then and, uh, and then you know the pandemic <laughs> happened. And, you know, so so I feel like I've been on the sidelines forever, man. You know. So let me ask. You said the wisdom teeth. Was that? Did you discover that after the second surgery, or after the second surgery? I uh, we actually we, we found it. You know, they they looked at the uh, the X rays, and I'm like, is this going to happen again? Because it's it's kind of scary to sling uh, sling leather at each other with uh <laughs> with with this being a, a possible you know thing that could happen again. And uh, so we, we looked at the, the x-rays a few times, and they said, yeah, this is actually one of the most common reasons uh, somebody might break their jaw is, is the wisdom, wisdom teeth. teeth. So you other fighters out there watching this, if you have wisdom teeth in there and, and they need to come out, get them out. 
get them. Yeah, out. I mean, you lost six. <laughs> you lost six months because of it. Now, uh, we, we <laughs> was the was the boxing match just to stay busy, or was that like a confidence boost to know that your jaw was okay? Uh, yeah, you could say both. I mean, it, it was uh, it was you know the the opportunity came up, and and um, before I went full force back into MMA. Uh, there wasn't an MMA card at the time when when I was ready to go, so uh, I said, "Why why not? You know, uh, do do at least one pro pro fight. I, you know, I always wanted to, to to turn pro in boxing originally, anyway. Um, so I, I I dabbled in in, in some boxing. You know, just, yeah. just now now if they want to call me a boxer, they can. You know? There you go. <laughs> so now you got it. So so you, like you said, we had a three year layoff. But you're at the you're at the age where guys make huge jumps in improvement. So we could see a three year improvement. So that said, when we see you return to action, like what is like what's the thing that'd be like, hey, wait to see my fill in the blank. Like obviously I don't want you to give away your okay. game plan, but my I don't know, my sharpness, my timing, my like what is well, what is it? Well, I've, been, I've been working real hard on crunches. I'm trying to have abs when I come back this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Hey, not not being able to eat. It's probably probably gonna help that a little bit. Yeah, right. <laughs> it, it, yeah, I tell you what, there was no easier way to weight cut than that. <laughs> now, let, let, my me, mouth shut. Let, let me ask you about about your opponent. What, what are, you, are you one of these guys that you watch film? Do you, do you study your opponent, or you just wing it? Um, it's it's funny. It's it's you know sometimes they're they're uh, when you, when you're not fighting an opponent with the, uh, that that had the opportunity to fight on something like Access TV or a fight pass there's really not too much good tape on on somebody uh or at least current tape um sometimes you see an amateur fight from a few years ago and you know it's it's maybe take a glance at it but don't don't study too hard into it because like you said you know guys come back they evolve they change they add yeah. things to their tooth belt you know and uh you don't you don't want to you know you want to expect the unexpected i sure. guess right yeah, trust me. I know how hard it is to get film because I do the contender series previews. So and some people, like someone who right. fights for a CS, it's very easy. LFA, one of these. But if you come from some of these other ones, I'm watching shaky camera phones from mom screaming, and she keeps missing half the fights, yep. cutting off. Yeah, <laughs> I, trust me. Trust me. I know. Uh, so it's tough. that said, you're starting to enter those years. You're starting to enter the years where we see you know the best of a fighter. You, you come from mm -hmm. CES. CES is a a organization that gets a lot of people into the big leagues in the UFC, long-term contracts yeah. with, uh, with Bellator, PFL, or something like that. How mm -hmm. far away do you think you are to, to that? Who knows? I mean, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do this fight and, um, you know, God willing, we get through it and then, and, uh, we, we pull off something pretty, you know, maybe, maybe another fight and then, maybe shoot for that contender series, yeah. you know, or, or something like that. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. And, uh, I don't imagine being too far away, you know, as long as I uh, get a good performance or two in, show, show we're back, show we're ready. That's it, hopefully, you know. Yeah. Um, so I see the Batman over the corner. That, I mean, that that must have caught you a pretty penny. That, that's a pretty dope. Um, yeah. Are you, yeah. Are, are you strictly a DC guy, or do you dabble in Marvel too? or No. I'm a I'm a total nerd, man. I, <laughs> I I I watch it all. I love it. The Marvel movies, the, the DC, the, the comic books. I'm 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 in it all. That's that's your, all. that's your thing, huh? <laughs> I, are you? Uh, I love it. I love it. big Star Wars guy. So yeah. now do you know you have you go to the movie theater and dress up? Is that is that you? No, no, I, I wouldn't say as far. I'm not. I don't go that far, but. <laughs> I did. I did go to the Comic Con once, the Rhode Island Comic Con. All right, so yeah, so, so and, you didn't uh, dress up. What was it? What what was it for me? <laughs> wow. Hey, I. But uh, I've been to McCoy Stadium when they had Star Wars night, and it was pretty interesting. Yeah. And that's yeah, that. That's imagine. that's something just for me and you to know. Though most of our listeners not gonna know what the hell I'm talking about, but. Um, you, well, you ever been to Warwick, Rhode Island? It's like the Star Wars Cantina. There you go. <laughs> 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 um, my, I'm, I'm running out of time. My last question for you, the last question I ask everyone who's got a fight coming up, you know, if I if I'm at the casino and I want to win money on Gary Boletto, what am I betting on? Hey, <laughs> that's that's uh, that's the question, huh? I'm gonna have to bet first round, first round finish. You know. There you go. I have to, I have to bet that way, right? There you go. And uh, you know, that's the way I would go. There you go, guys. If you if you want to win money, 
April 30, make sure you bet on Gary. First round finish. He just said he guarantees it. I think I heard him say that. I, for those who I'm don't speak. I'm too lazy to go to round two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, guys, I, I want to thank Gary for his time. He's absolutely fantastic. It's been way too long for us to, to not hook up. Uh, he's making Rhode Island proud, making me proud to be a Rhode Islander the way he's killing it. Uh, yeah. Guys, th- thank you for listening. We had an unbelievable all-star cast, and you just listened to MMA past, present, and future.